system and with it being the beginning of springtime, everyone's thinking about what they're going to plant in their backyards. We thought it would be a good time to revisit our bees. So, woo, 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 woo. Uh, well, a little bit about me. Why am I qualified to teach this? Um, I worked for uh, in the zoo field for many, many years. Uh, my primary degree is in entomology, which is insects. Um, I'm not as specialized in bees. I've tended to work more with beetles and stick insects um, and diptera, which are your biting flies. Um, but I did work some with parasitic wasps. Um, I actually worked for a greenhouse and I uh, bred and reared out parasitic wasps. Um, so that way we could produce uh, chemical treatments in our greenhouses because those parasitic wasps parasitized aphids. Um, so there are really good ways that we could keep our aphid populations down without having to spray pesticides. Um, so that's part of integrated pest management, if anyone's interested. Uh, but yeah, so mm -hmm. a lot of years working with insects, that's prim primarily my focus um, in my career. Um, I have also worked with mammals, birds, and uh, of course reptiles. Um, but yeah, that's a little bit about me. I did also apprentice at under a beekeeper for a summer. Um, that was years ago though. So to be honest, I've forgotten like probably 80% of what she taught me. Um, but like still getting through that experience was really interesting. Um, uh, very uh, cool process how honey is collected. Um, but yeah, so let's get talking about bees, you guys. Um, so whenever we start an all about talk, we always like to talk first uh, about what is an animal. Um, that can kind of trip some people up. They don't realize as many things are classified as animals as they are. Uh, basically animals, as I put in the slide, um, insects are animals, ducks are animals, sheep are animals, hmm. um, all these guys are animals. I didn't know insects were. So when we say the word animal, what exactly do we mean? Well, we have a nice big fancy scientific definition for that, but let me summarize it into some quick, easy bullet points for you guys. Um, animals are multicellular. That means that they're bigger. They're, we can see them with the naked eye. All of us are multicellular. Our dogs are multicellular. Pretty much anything you can see the naked eye is going to be multicellular. Um, they eat complex food, so this does not mean photosynthesis. So everyone here, um, anyone here have a favorite food? Raise your hand if you have a favorite food. <laughs> yeah? My gosh, some of you guys have kind of boring lives if you don't have a favorite food. <laughs> um, but eating that complex food, so eating a hamburger or a salad or sushi or cereal, that is part of the traits that makes us animals. We're eating a complex food. We're not sunbathing and just absorbing sunlight for our energy. We are consuming some type of food. Um, all animals can move for at, one, uh, at one point of their life cycle. Um, so all animals have the ability to move limbs uh, during, a, during a stage of their life cycle. Uh, sponges are probably the best example of that. Sponges can only move during their younger stages. Once they turn into adults, they are completely sedentary. Um, but they do move during part of their life cycle. So they are Sponges, animals. what is that? Uh, and then the last yeah, thing actually. is that we have complex um, organs and muscles. Oh. So if everyone takes their hand and sticks it on their chest and feels their heartbeat, <laughs> so all animals have some type of uh, specialized organs or muscles that help power their body. So those are the four traits that make us an animal. Um, and insects have all of those, uh, including bees. So we look at our big chart of all the animals. Uh, we're going to look particularly at our insect group today. That is where our bees are located. So on the very top of that tree up there. And yeah, what's the buzz about bees, you guys? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I asked you guys earlier um, if you guys had a favorite food, and most of you didn't raise your hand, which is going to get really boring because this talk is a lot about food. Uh, because that's why bees are so important to us. They are the reason we have so many great, delicious foods out there. Um, and you, everyone raise your hand if you like fruit. Yeah? Keep your hand raised if you like vegetables. At least one vegetable. I know most of the kids are going to drop their hands. Yeah? Anyone up here like things like hot sauce or nuts, things like that, right? Yeah. Yeah. So those are all really great things that add diversity like to our too. diets. Um, they help us get all of our micro and micronutrients. They help us have tasty, delicious meals. Uh, food is really important to us. And if you like food, you should definitely want to help protect our bees. Um, so the buzz about bees, they do a ton of free labor for us. Um, bees are huge pollinators. They pollinate a ton of stuff um, outside of your garden, out in crops and fields, in orchards. They are super, super important. I have several slides in here where I give you some numbers. Those numbers are insanely huge numbers. It's really hard for us to really wrap our heads around that much money. 
But bees make our food affordable. Without bees acting as our pollination services, um, we have to either have someone pollinate by hand or we have to find a new uh, plant to eat. Um, so having worked in a greenhouse before, the cool thing about greenhouses houses are they are enclosed from the outside environment. So they're protected from pests, they're protected from diseases. So that also means they're protected from things like bees. So plants that are in the greenhouses have to be hand pollinated if they require pollination by another species. And what that means is, um, so I was the entomologist on team, so I had you know my nice little job praising all my you know parasitic wasps, it was all great. But there were interns whose entire job was to go out with a piece of paper, go up to a flower, tap the flower, collect that pollen, go to another flower, pour that pollen into the flower, go to the next flower, get some pollen, collect that pollen, go to another flower. That was their entire eight hours, you guys. <laughs> Um, 
uh, through the scientific method. Um, we class them down so we can organize them and collect data on them, learn more about their life cycles, be able to use that information to make sound decisions when we're doing things like trying to protect them or things like that. So I'm not going to go too much into family trees because we do have a lot of younger kids um, and we're a little wiggly today, so I don't want to get too boring. Um, but basically, our bees are in our animal uh, group, uh, so the kingdom Animalia. Uh, then they break down and they join the arthropoda. So arthropoda are going to be our arthropods. It's going to be our stuff about skeletons. So all of us, if you guys feel your back, you have a backbone. You're part of Cordarda. Um, that's going to be the same group that wolves are in, elephants, anything with that backbone. Um, we go down some more. We're in our insect class. Uh, then we go down to Hymnoptera, which is our ants, bees, wasps, soft flies. Um, and then the whole are going to be uh, we have about five different, uh, sorry, seven different families uh, within um, Hymenoptera. So we have a really good amount of diversity in our bee community, which is kind of crazy because people tend to think of just the European honeybee when we think about bees. But there's actually a ton of diversity out there, and that's what I'm going to spend most of my time talking about. Um, yeah. So as I said, we're in an order of Hymenoptera, same as the ants and wasps. Um, so what makes them Hymenoptera is they have a complete metamorphosis. Does, uh, raise your hand if you know what metamorphosis is. Yeah. Okay, we got some. So metamorphosis is when a caterpillar turns into a... Uh, Butterfly. Um, it's not metapod. Wow, sorry, that's a Pokemon. <laughs> a cocoon. <laughs> I knew so, that. I told you guys, sometimes my brain just like breaks and it doesn't remember really real words. Um, so it turns into a cocoon and then it turns into a butterfly. It's um, actually a... <laughs> Sorry, that was a really so, bad moment. Uh, yeah. So they have you know what I'm talking about. They Not a cocoon. Then they have the sorry, the larva cocoon to be. Well, these guys knew what cocoon. Um, they typically will have a waist <laughs> that cinches. So most of our bees, ants, wasps, they have a little tight cinch waist. The one exception to that is the soft flies. Um, so they have a little cinch waist. solitary. They may have some type of social community to hang out in, um, but the social lifestyle we think of it as an ants, that's common for the ants and some of our bees. Um, so we'll talk more about that in just a minute though. Um, but here's some good picture examples. Up here is a saw fly. So you can see that's the one that doesn't have the cinch waist, the one that like defies the expectations. Um, but our ants, our bees, and our wasps all have that tight cinch little waist. So it's a really easy way we can look at them and identify them. Now talking specifically about bees, how do we tell bees apart from wasps, ants, and soft flies? Yeah. It's pretty, uh, there's some good tricks for it. Um, some of our uh, easiest ones to look for is a lot of bees have some type of pollen basket, so they collect pollen on their legs. There are some that don't have mm. a true pollen basket that doesn't get as big as that, but that little pollen basket is a good thing that they can look for. Um, they land on their flowers to feed, so if you see a something hovering and it's drinking from a flower, it's not going to be a bee. So bees always land on the flower when they're feeding. Um, their antennae are what we call elbow. So if you guys look at these antennae right here, there is an obvious crook in it. It elbows, so just like this. Um, they have an abdomen that's nine segments. Unless you're looking at a microscope, you're really not going to look at that. But it is the, one of the characteristics of them. Um, their eyes don't take up their entire face. So if you look at something like a fly, flies' eyes are huge. They take up like a huge amount of their face. Um, your bees, it's going to be a lot smaller. So if you look at that picture up there, you can see we do have big eyes. They don't take up our entire face. Um, they have unique ma uh, mouth parts. They have that mandible, that chewing jaw. Um, so we do have things like leaf cutter uh, bees and ants. Um, but they need those jaws to be able to cut those leaves. Um, and then they also have a very long tongue. And then typically they're very hairy, um, while your wasps are pretty hairless. They'll have a few hairs, but not a lot. Um, so those are some really easy ways that we can tell bees in it, uh, apart from other insects. Because there's a lot of bee mimics out there. So with those traits in mind, and the traits that we just talked about with um, our hymenopterans in general, I'm gonna give you guys a quiz. 
So, hope you're paying attention. Um, we're going to figure out whether or not something is a beat or a mimic. So, our first image, what do we think? Mimic. Okay, raise your hands. Who can tell me why they think it's a mimic? Right there. You know a mimic? Do you know why it's a mimic? Anyone can tell me what about a trait? It's not, you're right, it's not a fly. It doesn't have the small waist. It's not a bee, that's for sure, but why do we know it's not a bee? I just gave you a bunch of traits. What makes this obviously not a bee? The antenna does not. Oh, that too, that's so a good one. Antenna are super long. They don't, they don't elbow at all. Right there in the back. These don't have wing covers. Very good job. So he pointed out that this has a wing cover. So this is actually a beetle. Beetles have uh, their first pair of wings are hardened into what we call elytra. And that's actually where the, the coleoptera, the beetle, gets its like uh, order name. It means sheath. So they have that sheath that covers those delicate membranes uh, to protect them for, uh, so they can be able to fly. So that right there is actually a beetle. Um, so that is a, uh, a local beetle. Store, huh. um, and it's one of our bee mimics that's out there. So that was an easy one, guys. I started off easy. You ready for a harder one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What about that one? Do you think it's a bee or a mimic? Okay. Mimic. I hear a mimic. Why is it a mimic? The antennas, the waist. Very good. She said that there's no pollen basket. That's right. I don't see a pollen basket. Do you guys? What else? What makes this obviously not a bee? What do you think? It's a bee. Except the antennas don't bend. It has a little bit of hair. Uh, no, bees are pretty hairy. A wasp. A wasp. Yeah. I, I, remember those was, uh, it hornet It is a wasp. wasp. So this is a yeah. common yellow jacket. And it does look a lot like a bee because, again, it's in the same order, the hymenopterans. So it shares a lot of our general characteristics. But it's not quite the same. It's a little bit different. Just want to tell it's going to be lack of hair. So we're only a little hairy. So what can they do to How about this one? That's a boy. Take a good look. Yeah. So he mentioned that they don't have any antenna. They do actually have antenna. They're just super tiny and they're clubbed. So those little tiny clubs right there, they're super tiny. Those are antennae. So it doesn't have that elbowed antennae. So you are correct, it is not a bee. Um, this is actually a robber fly. So this is a fly species. Uh, robber flies are super common. They look like bees, trying to keep predators and leave them alone. Uh, <laughs> it works pretty well for the most part. What about that one? What? What do you think? I think it's a yellow bee. Uh, it's not a yellow jacket. What do you think? Do you think that's a bee or a mimic? Very good job. Why do you think it's a mimic? The antenna are not elbowed. Very good job. The antenna are super easy to tell when they're that tiny. It's definitely not going to be a bee. That is another species of robber fly. Okay, guys, the last one. Are you guys ready? Yeah. You ready? Yeah. What about this one? Bee. Bumblebee. 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 No, it's a mimic. Oh. I heard it's a mimic. Maybe it is a mimic. Right. Because I'm not seeing okay, the elbow. Why do you think it's a mimic? What shirt? Bumblebee. Oh, wait, you think it's a bumblebee. If you think it's a mimic, why do you think it's a mimic? It doesn't have the elbow antenna. Okay, good job. It does not have an elbow antenna. This is a mimic that looks a lot like a bumblebee. Um, so this is another species of robber fly. As I said, there's a lot wow. of flies that look like bees. Um, but you can see it doesn't have an elbowed antenna. Its antenna is right here. So that's its antenna right there. So it's very straight. So very good job, you 
Uh, no, a type of fly. Uh, telling whether or not something is a bee or a mimic. Um, if you guys are interested in doing something like that, I absolutely recommend trying to capture a picture because that's much easier when you can look at the picture than trying to like track a flying critter around. So you guys did a great job. So let's talk a little bit about bees in general. Uh, we have uh, a good diversity in our bees out there. Um, this is a really quick family tree that just shows some of our big groups. But I'm going to talk a little bit more about each of them in just a few minutes. So let's start off with kind of like the big question that everyone always asks. They want to know about the honeybee. Honeybee versus native bee. It's a very controversial subject sometimes, depending on the people you talk to. Um, but what's the difference between the two of them? So talking about our honeybees, the honeybee that we have here in Texas and in the United States is not native. It was brought over from Europe. Um, so we have the European honeybee. If you guys enjoy coming on any of our food services or food stuff, uh, it's going to be a European bee honey. Um, our other bees don't really produce honey, um, so it's really going to be these guys that produce those huge hives. Um, um, so they are a new species. Uh, they are introduced from Europe, and they are what we consider to be a domesticated species of insect. Uh, which is really rare. Uh, we don't really have any other insects that we would consider domesticated. Um, but bees are managed by people very effectively, and they've been managed by people for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Uh, we found records of beekeeping taking place in, you know, ancient Mesopotamia, ancient Egypt. Um, bees are crucial to our civilization uh, in many, many ways. Um, so these guys were super important back long, long, long time ago, and they're still important today. Um, so they're brought here in the 1600s, so pretty early. They are very well established here in the United States. We don't consider them an invasive species. Um, we consider them an introduced species. Um, so they don't uh, impact our environment in a negative way. Um, there is plenty of pollination to go around. In fact, we need more pollinators. Um, so pollination, pollinators are one of those uh, critters that we really always just need more of. Um, so uh, they do fairly well here in the United States. Um, and here in the United States, they pollinate about 80% um, of our American uh, crops. Um, the reason they do that lot. is because beekeeping um, is a career. So beekeepers will travel with their hives from farmer field to farmer field, from orchard to orchard. They're paid to do that. They'll leave their bees in an orchard or a field for the season, for a few months, depending on the plants. And those bees will pollinate that region for them. When the pollination is done, they'll collect their bees back up and they'll move to the next field. So this is an industry. Beekeeping is a really important part to our agriculture. Um, there's a lot of people who have orchards that will just have bees permanently in their orchard. They'll have, they'll work with beekeepers, and you know they'll do land share uh, stuff like that. Um, and that's because those bees again are guaranteeing crops. Those bees are providing those farmers with income. Uh, so it is a really important industry here in the United States. Um, but let's talk about our native bees. They're also super important and super cool. Uh, they're not better uh, or worse than European honeybees. They just fit different roles. So they're both really important. Um, so with our native bees, we have over 3,500 different species found here in North America. So there's a ton of them. I am not going to go through every single species. I promise. I am not that smart. I can't remember all those names and everything like that. Uh, but they do a lot of really important things for us. Um, however, they can't really be managed by people. Uh, so the reason the European honeybee uh, works so well in management with people is because they have that social life cycle that's all focused around one queen. Well, Native American honeybees, or just bees in general, to be honest, they're all queens. Uh, honey, uh, honey, the uh, European honeybee, totally super cool with worshiping one individual. American bees are like, yeah, we're all super awesome. We're all queens. We don't need one person to rule over us. They're very independent, you guys. Um, so even a lot if they like do us. a semi-social <laughs> life cycle, even if they do kind of hang out together, it's more like an apartment complex than a palace. Um, so they mm -hmm. can't be managed easily by people because with our European honeybees, uh, a beekeeper can go in and they can capture a queen in what we call a comb. Um, so it's basically like, a, almost looks like a barrette clip. Um, and it's, uh, ha its bars are wide enough apart that normal bees can pass through, but the bigger queen can't pass through it. So her workers can still get to her and take care of her and take the babies, but she kind of just hangs out in that spot. So if a beekeeper needs to move a bee colony, they can put the queen in a comb 
and they can move it because the uh, uh, regular honeybees aren't going to leave a queen alone. Um, here with our native bees, they don't care. <laughs> They're like, oh cool, you got Stacy. Nice, we're going to keep doing our thing. They're not going to follow the other bees. So that is why we can't really domesticate uh, native bees the way we can European honeybees. Um, they do pollinate plants differently um, than our European honeybees. Um, that is partially because native honeybees have spent thousands and billions of years living in the American continent. So they've been very closely intertwined with our native plant species. Our bumblebees in particular do what's called buzz pollination, uh, where they vibrate in the flower and it basically stimulates the flower to release more pollen. It causes mm. any fruit production to be larger and it also causes them to release more pollen in general. So it's faster, gives us bigger fruits, um, so it's a much more effective way of pollination. Um, again, that being said, we can't uh, have bumblebees going from hive to hive, to orchard to orchard. So you have to really rely on the native populations in situations like that. Um, it takes a lot fewer to, native, uh, to pollinate uh, uh, when it comes to native bees. Um, you know, it can take thousands of European honeybees to pollinate a crop, a field. It can take a lot less of our native bee species. Because again, they have that really closely intertwined relationship with our native plants. So, very, very cool process that they do though. Um, so, one little fun thing to add, if you like tomatoes, absolutely you should like our native pollinators. Uh, tomatoes are one of those plants that, um, unless they're a self-pollinating variety, which we have bred out, so we have a few types of tomatoes that are self-pollinating nowadays. Um, but most of our toma uh, tomatoes and the original tomatoes are not self-pollinating. They absolutely require bumblebees to pollinate. Or you can hand pollinate them and it's super tedious and boring. Um, so definitely uh, bumblebees are super mm -hmm. important for that process. So in conclusion, a lot of our chilies, our tomatoes, things like that are uh, pollinated by our bumblebees. If you like it, you can buy it right up here. Yeah, yeah, I don't really like hot sauce. I love hot sauce. I'm like addicted to it, it's not healthy. Uh, you should really like bumblebees then. They're super important for that chili production, tomatoes, all those important delicious things. Okay, question? It's called bee honey bounds. I'm not really going to talk about that too much because that's more of a beekeeping subject. Um, but it is really important with European honeybees to manage their hives yeah. because they do produce so much when they're given ideal conditions that it can actually backfire. So uh, beekeepers and bees have a really cool relationship. Uh, it is really fascinating. Um, if you're interested in something like that, there are some beekeeping societies and clubs that you can join. Uh, there's one up in Conroe actually. Um, so you can absolutely, if you're interested in that kind of stuff, I'm sure they do education programs too and they talk more about actual beekeeping. Um, I'm not really going to talk much about beekeeping um, just because I want to talk about bees because they're super cool too. Um, but yeah, question. <laughs> Most of our native bees are solitary. So, 
Communication with bees is really important. All bees will communicate with each other. They will help each other, uh, especially if they're in the hive. They have to help each other find uh, food. Uh, one interesting fact about bees is it's going to be the oldest females that are actually the foragers. So the way the division of labor works with the regular females is um, the first job that they have is taking care of other babies. So as soon as they emerge as an adult, they take care of babies. Then they become a guard for the hive and they help protect the hive. Their last job is to be a forager. So, you know, we send grandma out to find the food. The rest of us hang at home. It's kind of mean. Wow. That's they, they do it that way because those bees are, are already on the end of their life. And foraging is the most physically demanding job in the hive. Um, so the females that are the oldest are going to be your foragers. Um, yeah, communication is really, uh, really cool with bees. They do it through um, scents, which we call pheromones, and they do it through dancing. So when they get into the hive, they will do a dance that will communicate the uh, uh, how the sun is shining down um, and how the landmarks wow. are so that way other bees can find flowers. So they'll do a fun dance, and it'll be like, hey, there's a flower in that direction. And they'll tell the other bee, oh, hey, if I go this way, I can find a flower. It's a really complicated process, and it's fascinating that scientists have, able, have been able to actually break this down. Um, this is someone's entire life was just figuring out how bees communicate, and I think that's so fascinating. I have way too short of attention span for that. Um, but talking about that social life cycle again, um, because it is the one that we kind of are the most familiar with, you guys probably already, you know, recognize this a little bit. Um, so we have three different types in a social hive. We have our queen, which is going to be this lady right here. We have our normal workers, and we have the drones. Um, so we have three set uh, uh, jobs in the hive, in that social hive. Uh, for our honeybees, you're going to have multiple generations. So we're going to have, you know, our great nieces and our great, great, great nieces working alongside of us. Um, so they are going to continue on for a while. The queen lives a lot longer than the other bees. So that's kind of how they can do that. The queen lasts much, much, much longer. Um, in your European honeybees, um, your hives are huge. So we're looking at 20,000 to 80,000 as kind of your general number range, which again is one of those numbers that's really hard for us to visualize, but that's a massive number. Um, you know, that's about like, that's like a normal size of people. On the other hand, bumblebees, if they are social, because there are some bumblebees that we do consider social, um, it's just a single generation. Um, so what happens is uh, the uh, bumblebees will, all the adult bumblebees will die out at the beginning of winter, fall winter time. They will have laid some eggs, which will hatch and will feed on stores that they have left behind in their nest. But it's just going to be that new generation by themselves, hanging out. Um, and typically they're a lot smaller. Uh, well, not typically, they are smaller. They're 50 to 100. So that's a lot less than 20,000. So that's not even, that's not even an argument. That's uh, a much smaller number. Um, so, you know, in this room right here, we probably have maybe like 40 people. So this would be the amount of people, or amount of bees in a bumblebee hive. So much, much, much smaller setup than our European honey. Um, now, as I said before, 90% of our bees are going to be solitary, not social. Um, so solitary bees do not have a hive structure. All females will produce eggs. They are all queens. Um, they might live together in like a grouping of an area, but again, I want you to think of that like an apartment complex. It's not the palace where we all take care of the queen. It is an apartment. We each have our own space. We each have our own little hangout. We have our own kids in there. Cool. I know your name. We exchange pleasantries. We're not like friends. You don't come over. Like, this is my home. <laughs> so very much apartment, not palace. Does that make sense? Cool. Okay. Anyone have any questions about how bees like operate? Yes, sir. Question? So they, it just it's just really narrow. So he was asking about the uh, tightening of a hymenoptera. So it just tightens up, um, but it's still there. It's still connected. It doesn't, it doesn't like float <laughs> in between like a magnet. But it's a good question. Do they die after they sting? Oh, that's a good question. Because I heard that they do. I've heard so that too. So we do have our males, our drones, but they really don't do much. I don't know about honeybees, like but out. wasps, I've heard that. They don't really live very long. They have a job. They do their job. They typically pass well, away after that. they're not aggressive bees. Yes, sir. Honeybees aren't. They no, unless you step on them. How do they make the hive? Um, that is a very long, complicated process. Um, I do not have a ton of time left because I like to talk. Um, so that would be a really good question.
that you can answer by getting a uh, book on these. Um, they have really cool processes where they collect that pollen and they turn it into useful things like beeswax and honey for themselves. Um, but that would be really well answered by getting a book on bees uh, in general. Yes, ma'am? When a bee's, uh, when an insect bee, wasp, whatever, stings you, do they die? Um, yes. So honeybees will. Wasps wow. will not. And I'll talk a little bit about that and eventually. I think when I, I bring okay. up European honeybees again, I'll talk about stinging. Uh, some bees and wasps cannot sting us. Uh, most wasps are actually paras uh, parasitoids, and they uh, are not big enough to sting humans. Um, our skin is too thick for them. So the uh, parasitic wasps that I reared um, and released in a greenhouse, they're about the size of gnats, and they could not sting. So the biggest issue was like if I somehow messed up opening a container and they swore in my face, I'd like inhale a bunch and then cough a lot and uh. kill off like half of my. Uh. That was like my worst thing I could do. So um, let me answer one more question, you guys, and then I'm gonna go on to my next slides. Yes. So the ninety percent that live by themselves. Yes. Honeybees eat honey, right? I'm sorry. What? Honeybees eat honey. Yes. So what do the other ninety? So the pollen, the nectar. So honeybees, um, the honey is really used more for babies. Um, they will eat that as adults, but it's more for babies. Um, but the pollen and the nectar, or sorry, the nectar, uh, and then the pollen is a byproduct that they bring in. Um, that's going to be their main food source. So, okay guys, let's talk about some of the species of bees that we have. So here in Texas, we have over 500 different native species of bees. Oh my gosh. Um, that's a lot. I don't want to talk about every single species of bee. Honestly, I don't know all of them. Uh, so bees are definitely, uh, in, in the insect world in general, it's, um, there's a lot. So a lot of times people will specialize in one particular group just because there's so many different species out there. Um, but I'm gonna tell you about like our big families that we have here in Texas. And these are some of the most prominent species or like well-known species that we have. Um, but again, 500 different species, we have a good amount of diversity. Um, this is a cool graph where you can see the, visually some of the different species that we have here. Uh, this is more kind of like a little graph, but you can see lots of different varieties and colors and patterns. Um, and we all have different things that will pollinate and different tasks. So, one thing I do like to touch on is stinging because that's a lot, uh, something that a lot of people are really afraid of. Uh, bees can sting. Uh, and some people can be allergic to bees. Uh, that's definitely a, a pressing concern if you are allergic to bees. You obviously don't want to get stung by them. That being said, bees don't want to sting you. Um, bees are pretty chill. Um, they really only sting if they think they're going to die. Um, Honey bees will sting um, in retaliation if they think you're about to harm their hive. So if you're hanging out and you happen to be near a hive and you don't realize that, and if you're smacking bushes with a stick, you might get swarmed by bees. They might come out to defend their hive. But for the most part, if we see a bee, if we just walk away calmly, you're gonna be fine. Um, so honeybees are really attracted to us in particular in the spring because we're all wearing these bright floral colors like pinks and yellows and all different kinds of bright colors, um, the, those Easter colors. Those make us look like flowers. So the bees are like, oh, hey, is there something tasty over here? And they might come over, they might investigate us. Um, if we just act calmly and we walk away, you have a very, very low chance of being stung. Um, really, bees just looking for food. Um, now, if you try to smack them or swat at them, they are probably going to sting if they think that they're going to die. Um, honeybees, though, um, their stinger does, when they sting, it does pull out their internal organs. Yeah. So that white stuff on there, that's her digestive system. So that is her, like, guts being pulled out of her body. Oh. So it does kill her. Uh, there is no bee hospital they can go to after they sting. Um, and the reason that they will do that if they think they're going to die um, is they do have a pheromone that gets released when they die that says, oh, hey, I died here. And other bees can smell that pheromone and say, oh, hey, you just killed our friend. Like, she just killed Susie. Like, she didn't come out of the hive. And they might swarm you because they're trying to defend their hive at that point. So if we ever do see a bee, just calmly walk away. Um, bumblebees are even less likely to sting than honeybees. And some of our other species of bees can't even sting. So really, when we see bees, we just leave them alone. You're going to be off pretty well. Uh, now, wasps are more likely to sting. Wasps do not die when they sting. They um, So bees have barbs on their stinger, which is why they die. This, uh, it's kind of like a fish hook. It gets stuck in the skin. 
wash in their hand, it's more like a knife. They can insert it and pull it out without any damage to themselves. So they are more likely to sting. Um, so, you know, if you see a yellow jacket, honestly, the same rule applies. Just walk away and there's a really good chance they'll leave you alone. If you're eating or drinking something, um, I like to leave an offering uh, whenever I move away from an area that has yellow jackets. Um, I'll, if I'm eating or drinking, I'll take a little like leaf or something. I'll put like whatever I'm drinking on it or whatever I'm eating, a little piece of it, and I'll leave it and I'll walk away. And a lot of times those yellow jackets will swarm to the offering instead. Because um, they're just looking for food. Like, you know, they just want, they just want food. So it's a really good way that you can kind of reduce your yeah. chances of staying. Okay. Let's look at some of our common B groups. Um, so I showed this chart earlier today. We do have um, a good diversity in our bees. They kind of form different functions in our in, in our ecosystem. I almost said society. They're not people. Um, but they do form different functions in our society. Um, I already talked a lot about our European honeybee. It is super important, but it is not native. So when we're talking about native bees and protecting native bees, you know, it still helps the honeybee out, so it's still important, but it's not quite the same. Um, but again, these are our honeymakers, uh, and they're what we consider domesticated insects. Um, domesticated is used lightly in this situation, but they are managed by people, which is basically what domestication is, is that they are managed somehow by people. Um, they don't produce a lot of honey, um, only about one twelfth of a teaspoon per bee per year, uh, per life span of a bee. Um, so it does take a lot of bees to produce honey. But again, we talked about hives that were 20,000 to 80,000 in numbers. So they have the numbers to produce that honey. Um, uh, again, a colony is 20,000 to 60,000. Um, and it typically consists of the queen. Maybe there's a second backup queen that's being, uh, that's emerging. Um, but it's really going to be that one queen, all the workers, and then a few drones. Um, so they'll produce drones, drones constantly. Those drones will go out uh, for mating flights if they need to. So, um, one cool fact is the worker honeybee only lives about six weeks. So again, I talked about that short life cycle. Uh, they live a lot shorter lifespans than our queen bee. Uh, the queen can live to be up to five years of age. Um, so she lives quite a long time compared to her uh, children. Uh, and when she is super busy in the summer, um, she can produce up to 25,000 eggs in a day. So for all our moms in here, imagine having 25,000 kids a day. It's a tough job. <laughs> um, again, this is just kind of talking about singing again. Um, they will sing if they're threatened, but it does kill them. Um, and if you're not allergic to bees, it takes about 1,100 bee stings to be fatal. So really, bees can't do a ton to hurt us. Um, we're much more dangerous to them than they are to us. Obviously, due to an allergy, that's a little bit of a different story, but most people are not, uh, not allergic, um, and you should know if you are allergic, so it's definitely one of those things where if you see a bee, you just take a deep breath and walk away. So, non-confrontational. So, my favorite group of bees is our bubble bees. They are so cute and round and adorable. They're kind of like the teddy bears of the bee world. Uh, they are social bees, um, so they do make those hives, but remember their hives are only about 50 to 100 individuals. Uh, they, will have a, uh, they will have a very different structure because of that, um, but they still do have that social aspect. Uh, they are the ones that do the buzz pollination, so they vibrate when they're on those uh, flowers, and that really does help produce better crops for our farmers, so it's super beneficial for farmers. Um, these guys um, are, we find the bees throughout the United States, um, but they're also one of our more threatened group of bees. Um, so they actually have several bee, bumblebees that have been added to our endangered species list. Um, there are several that have not been documented in uh, decades. So we don't know whether or not they're extinct, but we haven't seen them in such a long time that they will soon be defaulted as extinct. Um, so definitely uh, an issue here in the United States, but it's also an issue in um, Asia and in Europe. Pretty much all over the world, bumblebees are not doing as hot as they used to. Mm. Um, the mm. rusty catch bumblebee became the first so bee in the United yeah. States to be added to the endangered species list. Um, however, in Hawaii, there are several bee species that are added to the endangered species list because they live on very specific beaches where they pollinate very specific flowers. And because they're in such isolated regions, they are completely different species at this point in time. Um, so they, they're completely different, and they live only in this one beach, 
where if someone comes in and decides they want to build a hotel, they can literally exactly. cause a species to go extinct. Um, so um, definitely, you know, worrisome. Uh, one cool fact when we're healthy is it pollinates our peppers, but it also pollinates cranberries. So I don't know if anyone here likes cranberries, but that is a, yeah, bumblebees are one of the cranberry pollinators. Oh, so super cool. Squash bees. Has anyone seen one of these before? Anyone guess what they might pollinate? <laughs> So very, very important for our pumpkin production, our squash production. Uh, they are about the same size as our bumblebee, uh, but they do carry okay. the pollen dry, so they don't have those big pollen baskets. Uh, so one of the things that bumblebees do, European bumble, uh, the European, sorry, one of the things that the European honeybee does is it will lick itself and it'll kind of smooth the pollen down, and that's where it gets those nice big baskets and it's smoothing and cleaning itself. These guys don't do it. They're just like, hey, we're gonna be covered in pollen. Life is great, we're super cute. Who cares? Um, <laughs> so they don't uh, uh, do that smoothing down. So they actually pollinate better because the pollen is more loosely attached to them. So when they go into a flower, it's more likely that more pollen will be brushed off. So it's actually a better pollination method than the smooth down method that our honey does. Um, these guys are, are solitary, but they will kind of hang out together. So instead of an apartment complex, think of like maybe like I don't know, like a neighborhood. Um, so they will like they're not they won't like drive each other away if there's other squash bees around, but they also don't like look for each other's company. Um, these guys actually dig their own nests into the ground, um, and yeah, they're ground nesters. So kind of cool. A lot of these actually do uh, make ground nests. So question. I noticed that. I'm glad she asked. <laughs> Um, and the males don't have a 
sacred stinger, and the female only stings if she's like trapped or squeezed. So again, we don't want to sting you. We want to be left alone. We want to just do our thing, and uh, but we will sting if it's our you know defensive last resort. Um, in the wild, they lay their eggs in small natural cavities, so things like woodpecker holes, things like that, would be their natural uh, laying grounds. Um, but they've adapted really well to human-made bee houses. So it's definitely one of those things where we can very easily make a bee house for them to put in our backyard. Leaf cutter bees! Has anyone seen these before? No! I've never seen one in the wild, to be honest. Um, but they're a really cool species. Uh, these are really good pollinators for summer gardens. Uh, and they pollinate flowers really well. Um, they also don't wet that pollen to their legs like the honeybee does. So they're a more effective pollinator because mm -hmm. of it. Um, and these guys do have a stinger and will sting. However, they are more likely to bite. So these guys have a really big jaw uh, for uh, cutting those leaves. Um, and so their primary defense mechanism will be to bite if they are messed with. So, you know, the nice thing is there's no venom, but it still, still apparently hurts a lot. I've never been bitten by one, so. Uh, mining bees, um, these are the bees that like to dig tunnels in the ground, they're the ones that dig the big tunnels. Um, so these guys uh, build those deep underground nests, they are solitary, but again, remember our apartment building? These guys are the apartment building lovers. Uh, so they'll dig that one big tunnel down and then a bunch of bees will just make their own offshoots. So we'll all have our own little tunnel, our own little apartment, we'll have our babies in there, everything's cool, everything's great. Uh, again, we are not in a palace, we're in an, uh, an apartment. Apartment, there you go, job, guys. Um, they pretty much all have stingers, uh, but a lot of times their stingers are too small to pierce human skin. So this is one of those species that even if they do want to sting us, they really typically can't. Um, it does vary based on species though, so if you go pester a mining bee and you get stung, don't come back here and yell at me. Uh, don't mess with wild animals. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And then um, the last thing I'll tell you about mining bees is they are very, uh, very short active period. Um, so these guys are active in the warmer time of the year. Um, they have a lot of activity and then they lay their eggs and the females die and the babies come out of the ground next year. So very uh, secular movement there. Um, now those are the main families of bees. I know I went kind of through that a little bit fast, um, but if you guys have any questions about any of them, I can answer real quick. fever once and I had to get on antibiotics. Um, if we lived only on honey and nectar, we probably would be very healthy Ooh. ourselves. But for bees, yeah, they would be very like, healthy foods. Yes. Um, so they actually use those cut leaves to build their like little uh, homes for their babies. Right. Uh, so uh, it's part of their whole like life cycle. They'll cut those uh, leaves up and bring them into their home and they'll use that to create their home for their babies. Okay, you guys. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about um, why these are important. It's almost over. Uh, it's been 54 minutes. I'll go through this a little quickly because it is a little bit of higher, uh, a little bit more uh, scientific -y. Um But when we look at the facts and we look at like you know scientific reports, we have tons of scientific research about these mm. because they are so critical to our food production and our economy. So these are definitely like an That's animal sad. that affects our economy very closely. Uh, there's a UN-sponsored report uh, that uh, drew, drew on about 3,000 different uh, scientific reports. Uh, it concludes about 40% of our inver inver invertebrate mm -hmm. 
pollination species. So that does include things other than bees, because wasps, wasps pollinate, there are some flies that pollinate, um, there are other species that pollinate too. Um, but about Chrysalis, that's the word I was looking for. Yeah. And again, if we think about that, HEV, uh, idle, and also 75% of our produce is gone, that's a pretty big deal. Um, there is a study, a two year study that was done that estimated globally, so I talked earlier about just the United States, but globally, um, the value of crops that are affected by uh, our pollination species like bees is somewhere between 235 billion to 577 billion. And again, those are insane numbers, you guys. That's not something that we can easily visualize because none of us uh -uh. have seen a billion of anything sitting out there. That's, that's too big of a number. So we're talking about such high, crazy numbers here. This is stuff that affects our entire world economy, and that's why these are so important, is they don't just affect you and I, they affect you know, families in um, Africa, families in Asia, families in Australia, all of them are affected by bee pollination and the crops that uh, our pollinators help us produce. So we did talk a little bit already about endangered bees. Um, we do have a few bee species that are endangered here in the United States. Um, there are currently 57 species worldwide on the endangered species list. Uh, when it comes to bees. Uh, and a lot of those bees um, have not been seen in decades. So they're still listed as endangered, but they're probably extinct at this point. Oh, jeez. Um, again, we talked a little bit about the rusty patch bumblebee already. That map there is the rusty patch bumblebee's traditional range. So all this light gray is where we used to be able to find this rusty patch bumblebee. Um, the stars are sightings that have been since 20, uh, 2012. And this map, this uh, graph is about a year old now. Um, but as you guys can see, there's almost no sightings of this bumblebee on the eastern sea coast anymore. So that is uh, concerning. We do rely on these bumblebees to perform pollination for our gardens, for our you know, landscaping, and for, of course, our crops. Um, and then why they have a ton of yellow-faced bees that are in danger at this point. Um, and again, most of that is due to habitat destruction. Um, one thing that always comes up whenever we do talk about bees is colony collapse disorder. Uh, this is uh, something that's affecting our social bees primarily. Um, basically, all of the workers will just one day decide to leave. They leave the queen behind with some of the younger bees and they just go off. And we have lots of theories on why this is happening. We don't know 100% for sure exactly why it's happening. Um, it's one of those things where, you know, in all likelihood, it's a combination of a few different uh, factors. Um, but some of the biggest factors uh, we see, um, and I will also add that this has always been a thing. This has always been something bees will just randomly do. They just up and leave their queen behind someday and just, they're done. Um, but it has been increasing exponentially in the United States in particular since 20, uh, 2006. So it used to be just like a thing that happens occasionally, and it's become a thing that happens a lot more frequently over the years. Mm. Um, and really, honestly, and there's a few different reasons that it could be happy, and it could be mine, it could be a few other things. Um, Monsanto. One of our biggest concerns, though, there's a certain family of pesticides that became more popular there you go. Um, a few decades ago. Uh, Neonectoids. Um, there are a lot of our home gardening pesticides, things like that. Uh, there's a lot of research going in right now to see if that isn't the cause for this increase in colony collapse disorder. Because again, these bees aren't dying. They're just leaving. Like, they just, for some reason, just have decided they don't like their queen anymore, and they leave without another queen. So these guys can't produce offspring, they eventually die out, and the queen will eventually die because she doesn't have her workforce to take care of herself in the hive anymore. Um, so definitely a concerning thing. This really affects beekeepers a lot, and this is something that they're very conscientious about. Uh, yes. How do they get a new queen if there's only one every five years and there's eight? So out of all the babies, one of those. So uh, to make a queen and a honeybee hive, she gets fed what we call royal jelly, which is a specific particular type of honey that they'll produce, and that, or jelly that they'll produce, and that will be fed to the larva, and that's what turns it into a queen. So it's all hmm. uh, it's basically a completely wow. uh, nurture situation. I've decided that this Larva 3682 is gonna be my new queen. Um, she'll feed uh, that larva, that special, uh, the, the royal jelly, and that will be what produces it into a queen. Um, so, uh, Interesting. Yeah, very, very specific uh, 
uh, set of circumstances. And then um, if the queen of the, hot, the current hive is not near death or anything like that, they'll basically kick her out and she'll go off, she'll go into a mating flight, she'll mate with various different drones that she finds, and then she will start her own colony. If the queen is on her way out, she's all elderly and um, can't really take care of, like, take care of the hive fully anymore, uh, that new queen will step in and take over. So, yeah. So, bee loss, we've talked about why bees are so important, so obviously we do understand that, you know, this is concerning. Uh, native bees are under similar stresses, but a little bit different. Um, they have experienced population losses, particularly the bumblebees, um, but they are a lot hardier than the European honeybee. And that's for a few different reasons. Um, the first is the fact that they are solitary. Um, so think about uh, when you guys go uh, and hang out in a big group like this. We're more likely to catch something like an illness, right? Than if we just hang out in our home every day, right? I'm not saying you should hang out in your home every day, but it is a fact if we distance ourselves from other individuals that can be carrying diseases, we're less likely to be exposed to diseases. So if I be as yeah, and then you weaken your uh, immune system. Okay. Here. 